Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast with your hosts, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, where we discuss all things related to outdoor and nature photography. In today's episode, we talk about all things abstracts, including intentional camera movement, patterns, textures, and other creative methods when out in the field. I hope you enjoy the show. All right. Welcome back to episode 18 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. And today we're talking about something a little bit different, but still pertaining to outdoor photography. Yes, uh, we're talking about abstracts and any kind of artful side of photography here. So anyone that's kind of thinks outside the box a little bit and does something more creative with their nature photography, it's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. All right. So one of the first questions we were thinking about talking about was how much of our photography we consider artful. So both of us do a wide variety of subjects. um, So we definitely shoot different styles of photos. So, Ryan, what would you say? How much is artful? Uh, well, I guess the first thing to ask a question on top of a question is, uh, what would you call like artful or something like that? So for me, I guess an artful kind of photograph that I would take is something, you know, it's done with some kind of taste or style. It's not really documentative where you just photograph, let's say, a bird on a tree. Or maybe you are slow down that shutter speed and show like the wing beats and the wing flaps if that makes sense and kind of blur that, that would be something that I'd call definitely more creative and artful. Um, or even you could talk about, you know, what, what is fine art, you know, and I, I consider that, you know, beautiful photograph, but it's something that could probably like hang on a wall in someone's room. Um, but I would say a good portion of my photography is definitely in that kind of artsy side of, um, what I, my work in general, because I do come from like an art background, um, even before photography of doing like painting, drawing, I think all the stuff I kind of mentioned on that first episode when we're introducing ourselves. Um, but yeah, so I just, I, I say that, yeah, art's always been with me. And so it definitely reflects in my work here with uh, photography. Mm-hmm. And do you try to do like, I know with some art, there's kind of an unclear subject. Um, it's kind of a principle in some styles. Do you do a lot of work like that where it's just kind of, kind of paint like, or is it mostly just, Painterly. Realism, yes. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I guess now, now I think about it. Yeah. I guess my work is kind of divided 50, 50, where I will do a lot of like, uh, realistic stuff where it's just, you know, photographing as it's seen like the, you know, the landscape in front of me, or maybe it's like a found object in something a little more intimate. Um, but yeah, the more artsy side I do, I do typically will do just patterns and textures stuff that's kind of really doesn't have a clear defined subject, but it's something that caught my eye and I want to photograph it accordingly to, you know, pretty much display that subject, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Sure. What do you do? Oh, uh, well, I would say I'm at least landscape wise, when it comes to wildlife, I feel like it's just more of a documentary kind of shooting, but Mm -hmm. For kind of the landscape, general nature style, I would say I'm more artful. I've never really been too attracted to like the wide vista, like 15 millimeters wide angle shot, like with the foreground and stuff. I've never really been that kind of like landscape photographer. I don't always zoom in, but I, I just like to capture it's it sounds so cliche because everyone does this nowadays. So I like to capture the <laughs> intimate details of the landscape. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> zoom in on a certain tree or zoom in on a a rock or just even get closer to a rock and focus on that instead um, and get the textures like you said. Um, For example, what I really like to do in the fall, for example, is if there's like, say, a bunch of yellow leaves on the ground, I like to look for the one red leaf and then Mm. uh, that's the shot. And I would say pretty much most of the time I have a defined subject uh, because it's just that's just the kind of work I'm attracted to, I guess. Like I always like to have something there. Like I'm not a big fan of like those, like all one color shots, like monochrome. Yeah. And like, just kind of, I like a clear subject basically. Um, So do you, do you like shy away from like minimalism? Cause that's kind of what it sounds like to me. Something that's too simple. No, I think, I think minimalism is great. Um, I think, that that definitely does have a cl- clear subject. Uh, some minimalism, you know, there's some that aren't, but there's some that are. It's just kind of a toss up because that that word's kind of like, kind of weirdly defined in the photography community, I guess. 
You know what I mean? Like, there's many different people use different definitions for it, I would say. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, there's more than one way to say it, at least. Mm-hmm. Because I know some people, they'll go to a beach and just shoot the layers of, like, the water and say that's minimalism. minimalism. And then some people will just will shoot, like, a, a lone tree and say that's minimalism. So there's there's many different definitions. Um, but, yeah, I like to have a clear subject, mostly. Mm-hmm. And as far as fine art, uh, like, considering my work fine art, I would say some of it is, uh, like, probably... My, some of my landscape stuff, especially waterfalls, I do like to shoot quite a bit of waterfalls. I I like to consider that fine art, um, mostly just because of the work I put into the editing. Even though it might not be seen in the photo, like doing focus stacking and all that, I just feel like personally that adds an extra quality to it. Uh, dodging and burning, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I feel like focus stacking, honestly, uh, it's more technical, I would say. I mean, there's definitely like an art to it, but overall, it's something, the process of it, you know, compiling all those image files together, I would say is definitely more technical. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. But my only thing with that is like, even like painting can be technical too. Like, I'm sure there are some fine art painters that use like the vanishing point, all those techniques. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just, I feel like, just focus stacking in general, it's just something, a photo I put more work into. It's like not a single frame. I have to blend things and do different techniques to just, I feel like like longer editing times for me is generally some of my more fine art work, in my opinion. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I, going back to what you're saying about having like a clear defined subject, I feel like that's just paramount to like any photo you would take. Honestly, I mean, like, like that's a good standard to really hold yourself to with anything, really. It doesn't have to be art photography or anything else, really. For sure, yeah. I feel like really bad photos are ones that don't have any subjects. Like, that's, <laughs> like, you just take a picture of a brick wall. Like, I mean, sure, it's a nice texture shot, but, you know, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, well, that's ironic because we're just talking about patterns and textures. <laughs> but Well, that's that's not even a pattern, really. The The brick wall is just kind of a... It's, you know, it's it's a it's a weird this is why we're having this discussion i think because it's it's a weird kind of like line the skirt i guess because it is like is there a defined subject no but like you could argue well you know the whole photo is the subject and some people say that's kind of cheap and it doesn't really count but it just depends on what you want to photograph i guess you know mm-hmm. maybe they want just that brick wall and it has all the same homogenized look to it you know it just really just depends it also depends what platform people are viewing it on. I mean, if they're on Instagram, they'll probably are more likely to like a photo with like a, a giant waterfall and like a sunset or something with like a dragon coming out of it or something. <laughs> um, but for prints, you know, a person might want to just a simple leaf on the ground to ponder in their house, like just look at it during the day and just think about the significance, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And whether it's a matter of it, like filling the frame too, as well. Uh huh. For sure. I guess it always matters about your focal length, and at that point. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, what techniques do you really use to photograph abstracts? Uh so if we're talking about just general abstracts, um, I would say that's probably my most most spontaneous photography. Um. Because it's really just, for me, it's just what comes to mind. It's, I feel like it's kind of the abstract mindset. Um, so for that kind of stuff, I really enjoy doing abstracts when I'm on like hikes. When Even when the main focus isn't really photography, I'll just have my camera on a strap um, and just kind of look for different subjects that catch my eye. Um, I'm never, especially in that situation, never really looking for anything. Um, if it shows up, it shows up, and I, I just take the picture. Um, it may not be technically perfect settings wise because it's handheld and everything. So yeah, I'll I'll carry it around handheld, and I, I found the most success with that. So I can be really spontaneous. As soon as I see a subject that might be good or just a good scene in general, I'll just quickly photograph it. It may not be technically perfect because it's not on a tripod and everything, but it's I still find the most success with that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it depends on the tripod if it, like, helps you compose a scene better or not. But um, I find a lot of abstracts I personally just shoot handheld. And it's not really out of, like, 
feeling rushed or like general laziness, but it's just kind of like it, it comes more creative, like creatively freeing, I guess if that makes sense, you know? So especially with like blurring and stuff, which we'll, mm. we'll touch upon in a little bit. Uh, another thing about handheld, they don't talk about if you, if you trust your like camera strap enough, which I do, it's like a, it's kind of like a seatbelt almost the material. <laughs> um, I'm actually quite the climber, so I will climb things sometimes to get new angles. Like I've, I've climbed a tree before to get a nice angle on something. Um, a little bit crazy, I know, but it's pretty, it's pretty uh, daring. <laughs> it allows you to be more mobile in general. Even if you can't climb things, you can still get to places you couldn't with a big tripod. So, mm, yeah, yeah, that's fair. I've never actually climbed a tree to really do something like that. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, I'm a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta get that I, I, I used angle. to be, I, I used to be a big rock climber, so I pretty confident. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I've never really like climbed a tree to really <laughs> see the view, I guess. But I'll have to try this someday now. I'm taking, <laughs> I'm taking notes at least, but. <laughs> yeah. So what do you use for your techniques? Um, It's, it's all over the place. I mean, I, I just, like I said, like to think outside the box, try different things. Um, cause especially with, you know, digital photography, it's so easy to just to take as many shots as you want. Um, obviously it's, you know, not always the best idea, but it's like, it's nice to have that kind of freedom of restriction where you just don't have to worry about, I have like, you know, a roll of film that has whatever 18, you know, exposures in it. So I can just take as many, if I want to experiment, let's say, um, take as many shots as I want and just trash the, you know, the bad ones and keep the good ones, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I do tons of different things. Um, I do lots of blurring, which will, like I said, we'll touch upon it here in a second, probably. Um, I do like lots of patterns, textures, kind of like the stuff you're saying with the brick wall, just kind of stuff that's kind of, it's, it's a pattern, so it's consistent, but it's like, it just spreads across the whole frame. It doesn't matter about the focal length or any lens choice. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but then I also do, I also do like to do, um, some chaotic kind of stuff, like we're saying. So not to negate what you're saying earlier, but, you know, sometimes the coolest shots to me are ones where it's just kind of all over the place, you know, and it almost doesn't make sense at first glance. Um, and then of course, water, you know, like what you're saying with long exposure, that's a big part of my work. Um, but I like to also just experiment with uh, reflections using like a polarizer filter. And then of course there's macro selective focus um, and just, yeah, just trying different things with light and color and seeing how it all interplays, you know, when I'm outdoors. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just, that's really what abstracts is about. It's just kind of creating your own shots based on, you know, what's kind of going on in the moment. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess we can touch upon the first one, which is ICM. So do you, do you do a lot of this? I would say I do a moderate amount of ICM, um, kind of at the moment. I, I do want to change this, but at the moment, it's kind of my backup. If I'm not getting any good shots, I, I'll go into some ICM. Um, it probably shouldn't be like that. I should be doing more intentional, dedicated shoots. But right now, it's kind of the backup. Um, but I, I really do enjoy it, and I never fail. Like, every time, I seem to get a decent result. So it's mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's an easy style of photography, but it's definitely has a high success rate, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Cause it's like, what do you really define that as like success wise? It's like, there's really no clear defined, like successful or failure shot. Does that make sense? Like, it's yeah, just well, I would say if there's, as long as you find a scene with a good amount of color, um, and like a pretty even exposure, I would guess, well, it doesn't even have to be an even exposure, but just a good amount of color. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, and if you do the right shutter speed and stuff, you can get some nice shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say for those, the ones I've done is like, I like to crank up the ISO or just the whole exposure really, but ISO and have it so the histogram is really to the right, like very far off to the right, which I mean, that's the proper way you're supposed to expose, at least I'm taught, you know, exposed to the right. But I just like to have them really, really colorful and bright, like you're saying, for and, sure. yeah. you know, tone, tone it down a little bit, at least in post. But um, yeah, I'm pretty much the same way with that. And even if you'd like blow out the highlights, it's probably fine to be honest. Cause <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it'll just be like a giant mix of highlights. So I don't know. It's like, yeah. 
yeah, the whole the whole thing's just overexposed. <laughs> I think I think the biggest problem when uh, post processing those is that it's the um, I have a lot of dust spots on my sensor, like or it just seems like they're always different ones, different spots, and it changes a lot. I'm very pretty sure most people have this problem, unless mm -hmm. you shoot mirrorless, of course. Um, but I do find I have to clone oh, them out. Mirrorless, mirrorless. Sorry to interrupt, but mirrorless has way more dust because we don't have a mirror blocking our sensor. Oh, really? Okay, I'm sorry. We get tons of dust. <laughs> Gosh. What I find with the abstracts, it's like it brings out, I don't know how to describe it. It brings out the dust spots. It, like they're much more apparent on any yeah, images it, you take. I mean, I would guess it kind of it kind of lengthens the dust spots, right? Because you're kind of moving your sensor around. So uh, it would like lengthen a little bit. No, they just show up as little dots. Oh, I just, okay. I just see, but like, I, I don't know how to describe it. Like I see, like if you, if you photograph the sky, just the sky, you would see the dust spots easily. If you're in like a much more scattered environment, you can still, it kind of, uh, obscures it, I guess. But like on the abstracts, it just because the bright colors and everything, I think, and the it's just all blurring, right? It just shows it a lot more to me. I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> There's probably some technical explanation with the slowing the shutter that maybe causes that, but you know, I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when it when it comes to techniques, um, which shutter speed are you usually at for that? Uh, I think about if I recall, a third of a second's a good rule of thumb. It's just slow enough where you, when you're doing, you know, tilting, panning, swiveling, shaking, it would pretty much, it, it's going to guarantee a blur of some sort. It might not be what you're after. It depends. Um, but I would say, yeah, something slower than just, just almost out of one second, somewhere in between that and just let's say one twenty fifth. you know, that, that's a good rule of thumb, but I will say, depending on what you're after, if you want some more, uh, let's say realism, that's kind of retained in the image get a little bit faster shutter. So it actually shows more of uh, your environment, let's say. Um, but mine, I like to, personally for me, I like to have them where it's more a little more far removed and it just shows color and maybe some kind of like, if there's a tree trunk and I'm following along it with the camera, it would show that little streak of, uh, let's say brown, if that makes sense, like a line of it. Um, but I like to make mine very, very far removed from reality, but that's just my personal taste. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I'm pretty much the same around the a similar shutter speed. Um, I think the lowest I'll go on that is two seconds, um, but I find that's kind of too, too much yeah, for me. Yeah, pretty much far from reality, but it just depends on the look you're going for, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't go any slower than probably one second. Um, and then uh, might as well say the other settings. Um, for aperture, I try to do the most narrow that I can. Um, so I'll be, I think usually I use a small telephoto lens when I do them and that'd be about F29 or F32. It's something very, 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 uh, small aperture, um, mm -hmm. is what I'd recommend. And for ISO, usually with those two settings combined, you can get a very, very low one. So like a hundred up to 200, I've done maybe 400 every once in a while, if it's like a shaded woodland that I'm at, but you know, more often than not, it's usually around 100. It's a pretty good rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for me, I'm pretty similar. Um, I'll set the shutter speed first cause it's usually the same. Um, mm. and then the ISO, I try to keep it at a hundred at all times, uh, for that at least. And then I'll, I'll just, cause I find that aperture doesn't really have much of an effect. So I'll just adjust the aperture based on what the amount of light I need. Um, so if it's like really dark, I'll go to like F4 or F5, 6 or something. Um, cause I, I really don't find there's much of a difference to be honest, cause you don't really need to worry about focus or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you shoot, um, I'm sorry. Do you use manual focus when you do your ICM or have you? Uh, I just usually focus to infinity and that always works. So yeah, manual focus. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's, it's hard to explain, like I said, with the idea of like these shots, cause it's like, you're not really. Some people might be asking now, it's like, well, what are you focusing on or why are you? Cause like, it's just going to be blurry. Right. But like, it's hard to explain. Like I've done ones where I purposely had it out of focus. Like you said, it's a manual and just kind of, you know what I mean? Just purposely blur it or to kind of be like mm -hmm. bokeh or bokeh. Um, but like, it still doesn't, it doesn't look right to me. Like you still have to focus on something, you know, typically, like you said, if you want to go to infinity, you may focus, uh, I think it's a third or two thirds of the way in the scene. Um, depending on how far you are with your distance and you know all that sort you see i i never have really had problems with focus before i guess it's just because um 
I don't know. I'm always kind of shooting far away subjects for the abstracts. I don't know about you, but I'm always. Oh yeah, me too. Always, yeah, I wasn't saying yeah. it's a problem, but yeah, I do uh -huh. shoot farther away. Just something about using a telephoto with these kind of shots, I feel like it kind of works better. I've done wide sure. angle ones, and it's kind of it's an interesting way to do it, and we could touch upon that um, as another technique within this um, method, I guess. But um, well, I I feel like with wide angle you're going to be capturing a large portion of the scene. So there's going to be like five or six different colors. If you're zooming in, mm. you're probably going to have like two or three. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it cuts out that grass, cuts out the sky. I see. Unless that's what you're going for. I've done, well, yeah, one, I've course, done ones yeah. where it looks like a landscape. Like you have a blue on the top. That's the sky and then green grass, yada, yeah. yada, you know, that sort of thing. And those and, look cool know, too. That's, so. that's why it's called abstract. Cause you know, you can do whatever you want, you know? Yeah, you are the creator in this uh, regard. You know, it's you're like the you're, painter. Yeah. yeah, Bob Ross. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like you're taking what you're seeing in front of you and just like, I, I think it's like, if you want to boil it down to the just one thing, it's like you're taking the scene in front of you, in this case, like a, let's say a landscape, and you're you're just kind of stripping all the elements and making it just about color, and basically, and a few patterns and lines that kind of just guide you along. But it's like you're just taking all these elements away and tossing them and just making it about one or two things. It's like you're simplifying mm -hmm. almost. It's abstract. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, um, um, what about tripods? I know it sounds crazy, but for me, I use a tripod for my ICM. Um, <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. I so can't imagine that. I don't know. It allows me to have a more distinct subject, even if it's very blurry, I can still keep the same composition. I'll just, I'll unloosen the, the like movement on the ball head, I'll just go up and down or side to side. I, I don't do both. I do one or the other, my shots. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I just find the tripod works the best. It's crazy, but that's what do, you, do. do you use a gimbal gimbal head with that? I don't have a gimbal, but I probably would. If... Huh? I just can't it with a ball head. That's so strange. A gimbal yeah. would make more sense to me, but like even then, I mean, uh -huh. I don't really have a need for a gimbal, but once I get one someday, Someday, my my dream is to get a 600 F4. <laughs> it's never going to happen, but if it does, I'll need a gimbal, so maybe I'll do it then. <laughs> our viewership can hold you accountable. I think you mentioned it before. <laughs> uh, yeah, and our, my viewers can cover the uh, $10,000 cost of that lens. So There's an affiliate link down below. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> That's funny. I just can't. I don't know. I probably did try something once or twice, but I don't know. Like I said, it's just something about having it just be handheld is much more freeing to me and you can just kind of do whatever you want. So, but I guess that answers my response and I shoot pretty much exclusively handheld in this regard. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I guess it's really just personal preference. I just, there's yeah. something weird to me, I guess about just waving it around. Like I feel like, especially when there's people around, it's a lot more official to have it on a tripod. <laughs> Well, no, no. <laughs> we're not Andy graying this thing up I mean he does great stuff don't get me wrong I don't really do the shake stuff like he does to make an example like I don't, well, I don't I, violently I, I, shake it yeah I, I will say one of my best abstract shots and this will be in the slideshow um, I'll also show it to you after or something but um, it was a 30 second exposure which I never do for ab abstracts um, but it was at sunset and I literally just ran around the beach pretty much with my camera. It's it literally like a, it was like the best abstract I've taken legit. Like it was. We, <laughs> so you're running around shaking at the same time, basically. <laughs> yeah. And it just I turned mean, out amazingly. I, I guess if you're running, it'd be shaking quite a bit, but like, that's just not 30 seconds. sounds insane. I know. Yeah. I kinda, but, I, you've inspired me. I kind of want to try that now. <laughs> yeah. Try it. Like even huh. like if you're on a hike, just like hold your camera in front of you and like walk for 30 seconds and see what happens. I've done that. Yeah. I, I've done stuff like that with touch shutter accidentally being pressed on and I'm walking and I hear, <laughs> I hear it press, you know, the mirror lock up and I'm like, what the heck? And I'm like, oh, I have to wait 20 seconds, you know, stupid stuff like that. I um, heard of this guy who was on like a really long hike and he put his camera back in his bag um, and his shutter got clicked down by like a, like something in his bag. So his camera literally took like a hundred thousand shots over the hike and he like ruined it. So, Oh my gosh. The batteries got sucked dry. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let's get us back on track here. Tangents. Right. Um, 
So like there, there's different techniques I, um, in ICM, intentional camera movement photography. Um, so th- let me just list out a couple of them that I do. Um, I'll do main, mainly I do panning and tilting, uh, which is where you just, as it suggests, like think if you like you're photographing a movement, like a sports like a football game or a bird in flight and you follow with your camera. I pretty much do the same thing with an abstract in this regard. Um, and then tilting, that's just kind of like moving it, you know, I don't know how to describe it, just tilting it basically as you mid shutter capture. Um, and then I'll even do ones where I zoom in and out, which uh, mid shutter capture, of course. And those can create some really hypnotic effects, I think. Um, but I, I don't really do this too much. Um, and then twisting, which uh, going back to what doing like a wide angle abstract, those are ones where I actually like to do those because they're a lot of fun. And you twist your body and do like a 360. Um, and it, it just creates a really kind of cool swirl, I guess, in the image if you're taking it horizontally. And then, of course, there's the camera shake ones, but I, I don't do this too much. I like to keep it more controlled and kind of more at my, uh, you know, keep my arms tucked in and kind of just pan and stuff, tilt. Um, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, those are. When you say pan and tilt, are you like panning and tilting at the same time or. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, probably a couple times I've done it both. Like, at the same, you know, for the same exposure. Um, no, I usually just do like a left to right, right to left as one image and then up and down or something like that. Um, I just find that works the best. Yeah. It really just depends though. I mean, like I said, mm. when you, when you had a third of a second, you really don't have that much time to really move it around too much. And I kind of like that. I guess <laughs> I'm contradicting myself because I was just talking about having freedom of, you know, expression, but it's kind of like, I like to have that kind of wind, small window of time to make the image um, just so you have to paint it very precisely, I guess, if you want to call it that. So yeah, I, I would recommend for anyone that may be interested or I guess get inspired now, now that they've, you know, I've heard of this type of photography because quite frankly, I don't feel like it's, it's a very niche kind of photography that um, very few people do. I know there's a new magazine that came out recently that's centered around the subject matter, uh, which is really, really cool to see that kind of awareness go up. Uh, but I would just recommend it's, it sounds like it's dead simple and it really is like just go out with your camera, slow down that shutter a little bit. Like we said, um, have a very, very small aperture, um, anything above like F 20 or anything, you know, higher F stop, all that stuff. Um, so like F 20 and above and just go from there and just try, like I said, try these different techniques, shake your camera. Um, if it's a zoom lens, zoom that in and out mid shutter twist, shake, like Henry said, run around the beach with it. Like just try different things. Yeah. And just see really what you come up with. Um, I would say the best time of year is fall foliage. It's a beautiful time to be out doing those kind of abstracts. Cause you just get so many bright warm colors that people love, but even summer with greens and browns and stuff like that work as well. Or even winter, you get lots of cool kind of icy blues and white and gray that kind of get mixed in. So I've done them all times a year and they all produce different results. But I, you know, I just happen to like a lot of them as well. So that's why I'd recommend if anyone wants to try it. Yeah, I mean, that ICM is really like a beginner could pick it up and you don't pretty need, quick. Yeah, they. I mean, you they don't need to know a camera. Quick. Like, yeah, for sure. I mean, you could even with to an extent. Obviously, you can't do long shutter speeds, but you could do like a nice ICM with an iPhone. I bet even. And honestly, mm-hmm. if it's a good composition people probably will notice the difference so um honestly, like honestly yeah, like these you're, people you're right yeah these people like andy gray who do like these uh he does amazing icm work but he is, he's like an expensive camera and i i always think when i watch his videos and stuff like why why do you have that camera i mean you know you, you could <laughs> have like a, a little tripod too <laughs> uh-huh yeah well he he knows what's up then <laughs> It's funny because he makes a big deal of it. He's like, oh, I'm bringing my tripod today. Oh, no, what am I doing? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. I think the thing that makes him stand out a little bit from most people is like he puts so much effort in the post-processing. Like it's like, you know what I mean? Like it's just it's like an abstract. So like I just don't I can't fathom how much attention to detail he puts in the making them how he sees fit. Like it's just insane. But he's, I mean, by doing that, he's pretty much cemented himself as like the best abstract photographer oh, in the world, him. I would say. He's, I would say, yeah, he's I, personally, I've seen quite a few, I think. And then 
course yours truly, <laughs> but like he's honestly head and toes above head and shoulders, <laughs> head and toes, <laughs> he's head and shoulders above the rest. Like from what I've seen, just because like I said, he puts so much attention to detail in the post processing and just, it just, it's insane. Like he has live streams dedicated to this where he just, people watch him edit photos and he takes hours to edit just one image. It's like insane. Like I just, I, I don't know, but like the results show it. Like you look at his Instagram and it just, it really shows it. Yep. And um, he, he has a distinct style too. It's always kind of that orange tint, like a nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A good, like a pretty large amount of blur, but there's still usually a distinct subject because I think he usually is like looking for castles or old houses. Um, or like, mm -hmm. I think he's in England or something. So yes. he's got a lot, a lot to work with there. So he, go, he goes to the beach a lot too, I think, which inspires that kind of like, um, like taupe sepia kind of look to it. Mm -hmm. That tan color. Yeah. There's like, another type of abstract photographers I really like. I've never really done this, but. It's just a really, really slight blur. Um, they're kind of almost basically landscape photographers, but it's uh, it's, like, it's like a like a soft focus. Yeah, if pretty much nothing's in focus, but you can clearly see like every element of the scene. Huh. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's it's really cool. I saw that in like the ICM magazine. I saw oh, like I saw it on that Instagram. Um, Huh. So I'll link that in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. But there's a lot of those kind of people in there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm just so yeah. I guess you set the manual, your focus. I mean, and you just kind of purposely eh, kind of dial it back so it makes everything blurred. But I can see that being really cool. Actually, I might it might be something I have to try now. I can't really yeah. recall a time where I did that purposely, at least. You may have accidentally done it before, and. Uh, <laughs> it, like I, I encourage all of our listeners to go back through your Lightroom libraries. Uh, give that photo of motion blur a second chance. Maybe you can bring up some shadows or something and make a nice ICM out of it. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good point. Is look back on your catalog and see really what you have because you might have a few junk shots that kind of pass by you and you're like, why didn't I delete these? But you know, maybe this, maybe this episode would get you like a newfound interest in like, okay, maybe there's something more there that I can kind of work with and you can enjoy. Mm -hmm. Even like, I, I just had this thought, I don't know if this is crazy, but like a intentional blur of like a bird flying. I wonder if you could like, yep. Get like... There's, I've seen those. Oh, really? That's oh cool. yeah. Like a, like a flock, uh, especially during like migratory times. Um, I've seen tons of where it's like a blur, excuse me, bird flock and it shows them kind of slow shutter speed. It's, it's it produced some really kind of insane results. Um, I would look this up. It's just fascinating to see these, like, I have guess you I ever seen like the long the exposures. Koi fish? No, uh, have you ever seen like the koi fish in the pond? Like people do long exposures of that. It's super cool. Oh, no, I don't think I've seen that in particular. Huh? It's yeah. It creates like same nice, idea. yeah, pretty much same principles. Creates like nice orange lines in the water. It's just really mm -hmm. cool. Conveys the motion and all that stuff. Uh -huh. That's really cool. Huh? I'll check that out. Yeah. I've never really like, gotten a chance to do like the birds. Sorry long exposure uh, I, i've wanted to but it's just you know never really thought of it never was ready quite for that i mean me with my f11 lens sometimes i cannot get those shutter speeds up <laughs> high enough to uh freeze the motion because that that iso gets way way up so i yeah that, i'll have to try that yeah fair enough yeah maybe this can be our homework as well for us both of us uh, yeah <laughs> that's great uh, but long, long exposure in general is just a really powerful tool. Like there's so much stuff you could do with it. Um, I would say it's definitely my favorite like area of photography. It's not really a style, but just favorite general shutter speed to be in it's, is that mm -hmm. region. I, I would call it a, honestly, I would call it a genre. Like it's such a big part of mo most of the time it includes like water. But I mean, like we said, it could be a you know flock of birds in flight. It could be a koi fish in a pond. Or, you know, cars going by, honestly, you know, with the headlights going off. I've done that plenty of times and that's fun to experiment with. Like there's just so many ways you can, so many ways you can just, when you prop that camera on a tripod and slow down that shutter, like just see what the results are. And you could be really surprised, you know, really what comes of it. For sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much concludes it for ICM, I think, unless there's anything else you want to add. No, uh, no, not really. Okay. They're fun to do though, guys. So I'd recommend it. Just Check try it, it once. 
try it and, like you'll try it once and it might suck but like try it like 500 times you might like it more and definitely <laughs> check out andy gray and all those people on instagram be really inspired or our slideshow on the youtube if you're <laughs> You're watching yes, and listening. We, we are master ICM photographers, so you don't need to look at anybody else. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're pretty good. We're modest. But anyways, um, so <laughs> another big part of big part of my abstract work is patterns and textures. And uh, we touched upon it quite a bit already, but um, I feel like it just goes with mentioning it's like your subject matter. Um, so if I'm out hiking, let's say a trail, and I can think of a few examples where I just like saw a neat pattern and it was like uh, dried mud cracks. You ever seen those where it just kind of like has this weird kind mm -hmm. of veiny look to it? Yeah, I've seen a few times where that's kind of occurred. Um, and especially if you get like little green kind of like plants stuff growing out of it. Um, that, that's really exciting kind of like time for me because I'm just like, okay, I can put on a wide angle and photograph this like straight down and it creates this cool kind of look to it. There's lots of lots of detail going on that you really have to can't just look at once and really see what you're looking at. You have to kind of give it like a double take and really absorb what you're seeing. Um, and there's, I've made quite a few of that or just like twigs kind of spurs interspersed across that dried mud. Um, tons of times where I've seen that as well. Um, even like stuff like ice, like frozen twigs and ice or leaves and ice that creates a really kind of artful look to your photographs. Um, you're documenting it, but it's like, it's something that's a little different. It's like people may go past that. And not really like fully appreciate what it is in front of them or even just like little patterns and textures and sand um that's something mm -hmm. i've seen a time Definitely. or two yeah where you just kind of you crop in is... and zoom in close and you kind of get that yeah it looks weird and different but then you go like oh it's just sand even even like even if you're not doing like an abstract just using that patterns and sand for like a foreground in a landscape can be really powerful as well uh I, mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah. Uh, another thing I would definitely look out for is like dew on grass. Like even if you're not shooting close up, you can get like a one of my favorite shots is after like the melting snow with dew and there's like this golden light that's like hitting the water. It's one of my favorite like abstract shots. Mm -hmm. um, so like definitely try to shoot in like the early morning if you're trying to get some nice like reflection kind of shots like that. Mm -hmm. I would say springtime is probably one of the best times for that because you get you know, mm -hmm. really, really cold overnight. And then the morning kind of thaws everything out. So like, especially in like April, I'd say is the best time for that kind of that really dewy grass. Um, so you get down real low, at least that's what I would do. Get down really low on that, you know, kind of like eye level with the grass, the grass blades and all that. And then uh, one technique I've tried and it's produced some really cool results. Um, it's if you want to get bokeh is that you manual focus. So it kind of puts everything out of focus and it kind of just picks up all these different dots of the water droplets and it looks really, really cool. For sure. Um, another thing that's really cool is if you go on a Creek bed, um, that's like fairly like that doesn't have a lot of rocks. Um, you can get some like really cool, like wavy textures from like the sands or from the water that like weathers the sand and the dirt. Um, I've gotten mm. some pretty cool shots with that. Um, and sometimes as long as you're not like destroying the environment, you could like, place a leaf there or something as long as it's like always already fallen off the tree or something um, and get some really cool shots with that. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's neat. It's neat idea. I've even done ones where if it's like a really, really shallow Creek. Um, and then there's like, let's say there's midday light. Um, I'm thinking of one example I took earlier this year and it kind of creates that, you know, like kind of reflective sheen on the entire water. Um, I kind of like the look of that. And so there's one time where I was just kind of like, you know, I'm going to prop up, my camera and stuff pointed at the water as it's flowing and it, it just has this weird look to it. It kind of looks like, um, I don't know what you call it. Like it looks really porous, like skin. It's just like a strange look. And you almost have to, like I said, do a double take and be like, what am I really looking at? You know, it's almost hard to tell, but um, it, it's just like neat to experiment with, I think. Yeah, for sure. And just really, really any texture in general that you see, even tree bark. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned mm -hmm. this, but tree bark can be really no. powerful. That's a good example. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Because tree bark, mm -hmm. it's like, um, no matter where you live, you probably, I'd hope, have trees around you, at least some trees. Um, but it's like there's so many different trees out there, and each one has their own unique kind of bark structure and patterns and stuff within it. 
And then you put on top of that, like, let's say like lichen, where it's like that, like moss fungi kind of stuff that you see. And it's just like, you could do so much with it. Macro, um, even wide angle sometimes, abstracts of that. Like there's just so much you can do with it, which is really neat. And it's truly a universal kind of photography. You can pretty much do that kind of texture, really close up style, pretty much anywhere. Like you could live in the ugliest place and still be able to find stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like you go out in your backyard and like I said, hopefully you have a tree, at least, at least one. And you could experiment that way. Like you don't have to travel a million miles away to take an abstract. I think that's a neat part. I mean, that, know, that's how this. I, that's how I started. I would bring out my little camera with a kit lens and just, um, just photograph the leaves and photograph just different plants around my yard. And then it, eventually evolved in the landscapes and wildlife and stuff. But you know, that's how I got my start. And I continue to do that today. So I got to ask now, like, do you think that like, do people start out as abstract photographers or do people like photograph realistic things and then go to abstracts? You know what I mean? I, I really think people start out as kind of catch all photographers, to be honest, or at least for me, I would like, I remember like the first month or two of photography, I would do a bunch of flowers, a bunch of textures, but I would also like photograph weird subjects in my house. Like I, I, I lit my piano once with like a lamp and like did a shoot of that. That's um, cool. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I did like a snowflake on my windowsill and like I would, I placed this plant by my window. I remember that was actually the first shot I ever took. It's like this plant. And then I went into Lightroom. I just got Lightroom. Um, and I, changed the color from green to blue and i thought it was the coolest thing on the planet uh, <laughs> yeah i remember the time i found that out i took like a whole woodland shot of like just like green leaves i believe and i switched it to yellow i was like this is the weirdest thing <laughs> this is the future <laughs> did you overuse it for like the first six months because i definitely did <laughs> <laughs> no i took the i took two copy images uh, jpegs exported them and i was just like okay this is cool but it's dangerous i don't want to like fake it you know but it was really I, cool I, to see that yeah. effect. Was, I would do like the drag down all other colors, keep the one color up. Oh, that yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been doing that recently too, just for fun. It's neat to experiment with. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and then and then I, I feel like people kind of niche down or even just um just discover what works best for them and based on their environment. Yeah. Uh, there's there's another group that get uh, cameras primarily just for uh, like portraits, and I feel like they'll pretty much stick to that. Um, but I feel like people like us, we really start out like you were saying, like abstracts, but a little bit more general too as well. Mm -hmm. I just think with like my art background, just non photography art, like I I'm just kind of surprised I didn't start with this kind of more style of photography, but it's something that like. Kind of like what you were saying, it's like, it's, I feel like most people do like a catch all. They're all just about photographing whatever, whenever. And I mean, that's cool because a lot of people start that way. Uh, but it wasn't until a couple of years in of like, let's say my nature photography career where I was like, let's just try this. And I just tried it one day with like some fall foliage, bright blue sky behind it. And I was like, this is, I was hooked. Like that day, I was just like, this is so cool. So I just been doing it ever since on and off. Yeah, for sure. I, I can't remember what was really the first shot that really got me into nature, but I, I think it was some kind of waterfall. Um, hmm. Yeah. Or no, I think what I, I really started as kind of a travel photographer because before all this pandemic, I, I would travel quite a bit. Um, so that, that really, I, I own, I really owe a lot of um, credit to that because it really, you really have to think on your feet, like a lot more of a nature photography, hmm. I would yeah. say. Cause it's just, there's a lot of people and you can't wait around. You just got to get the shot. Now, not yeah. saying I got any amazing travel shots, but um, <laughs> it was definitely still a learning experience. So was, well, yeah, it's worth mentioning. Let us, you let us, yeah. Let us know down below if you'd like a travel episode. I know just the guest for that one, um, but we have to stay tuned for that. <laughs> Things in the works. Oh yeah. Yeah. That'd be a yeah. good guess. I know what you're talking about. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tight lipped on that one, guys. We got some good guests coming up, by the way. So stay tuned. <laughs> big but... names, big names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can't even contain ourselves. Yeah. I, I, I will say about travel, since you mentioned it, it's, you don't even have to travel far, too, which is neat. Like you can just mm -hmm. be in your, I've done travel stuff in my hometown, you know, and just, yeah, you don't have to travel far. Simple as that. 
And but, there's no reason to limit yourself. I mean, I remember Ryland was talking about this two episodes ago. He's um, defying what other people are saying and just doing him and, you know, just he, doing all the styles he likes. And so. he's, he's succeeding at it, I think. Like, he's doing yeah, what he loves. Sure. And he's, uh, like, he's getting a lot of haters. I don't know why, because I just feel like it's unwarranted. But, you know, he's just paving the way for himself. Doesn't Doesn't really care about it. Doesn't really care about the haters, I mean. <laughs> but anyways, uh-huh. we're, this is like, we're the king of tangents, I swear. Uh, so, yeah, we'll touch upon I a mean, few. That, that's, isn't that all podcasts, though? Just tangents. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh-huh. no fun if you don't, you know, talk about stuff off topic, uh-huh. I guess. But, um, yeah, let me touch upon a few other techniques I do for abstracts. Um, so, water reflections, um, like I mentioned, w- water is a big part of my work. Um, I know we talked about long exposure a little bit. Um, but reflections in particular are something that I really like to seek out because you can do so much with it. Um, let's say if a bird is perfectly framed in image and the water is very, very still get a reflection of that. Um, but what I'm really talking about in this case is like where I'm isolating just the reflection itself. So it creates its own kind of abstract, um, if that makes sense. So let's say I'm across from a lake and I see some like birch trees or sycamores and it has that white bark. Um, I can think of one example I'm looking at now and there's like some brown water reflected in the lake. Um, but so what I do is I tilt the camera downwards, focus on the water and I make sure that just above where would be the top of the frame is the horizon, but I cut it off. So all you're seeing is water, um, but it creates this kind of ripply effect. That's really neat that um, I guess you call it painterly. It has like the neat look to it that I like to, I know it's something to seek out. I think whenever I'm outdoors with the camera. Yeah, reflections are super powerful. Uh, just a, just a tip for everyone: uh, polarizers can eliminate your reflections. So if you're trying to get a good shot, uh, make sure you're not polarizing that part of the scene. Uh, I know mm-hmm. I've done that before. Um, yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Do you kind of do you ever like zoom into reflections, or you, you get kind of the wider reflection, or? Um, like I said, most of the time I do, I will, I will use the zoom pretty much all the time. Um, usually it's a small telephoto is what I use, um, for pretty much most of my abstracts, honestly. Um, but it just helps the, you know, compose it a little better, I think in this regard. Um, but yeah, it's, what, what, what would you use? I would say, what would you use? I don't do a whole ton of reflection shots. Um, but I would, I would definitely zoom in to that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess another thing is like, it just, it depends on what you're going for in composing. Um, Sometimes like I'm thinking of one image it took probably about three years ago. So it's, it's quite an older image. Um, But let's say if there's a piece of driftwood or it's just like a dead tree trunk, just floating in the water or even just a twig that's kind of sticking out. And I will compose the photograph so that it's an even horizon right in the middle of the frame. And it creates that really pleasing look with it because you get the reflection. And of course, that's probably going to be symmetrical with the actual, you know, whatever it is sticking out of the water. Um, and that's a neat kind of technique that I'd like to do. So that way it just creates symmetry, I guess, and kind of nice mm-hmm. balance to the image, visually speaking, or even like yeah, reed, gr- sure. reed grasses. I've done that probably a time or two um, where that just looks, it, it creates such a cool effect. I don't know how to describe it, but you just have to try it yourself. Just like some reed grasses or something thin sticking out of water, and then, like I said, just frame everything so it's kind of nice and centered. It creates a neat kind of abstract. Mm-hmm. Have you done any, uh, like, work with, like, your wildlife lens? Have you ever tried to do any abstracts with that? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> there's a time or two where I'm, like, I was in a bird mode or whatever you want to call it, and I had it attached. And I'm, like, looking afar, and I'm, like, wow, that's, like, I'm just seeing, like, let's say a woodland or something. I'm, like, it's so far away, but I'm, like, I kind of like the look of it. And so there's been a few times where, yes, I've, I've just used my 150 to 600, you know, it depends on the focal length. Right. But I would just, you know, make a blurring abstract or something, or even a water reflection. I've done that a time or two. So just depends on what's available, but sometimes I am lazy, you know, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I found that my 600 millimeter really can create some great abstracts. Uh, it's kind of like if you plant it, or pointed at like any plant I find it just creates this beautiful, like blurred out look. Um, mm-hmm. and it's just, I don't know, really cool. You're definitely not going to get anything realistic with that focal length. Um, unless it's Wait. like super far away, but you can still get some cool stuff. 
But that background is going to look really clean though. Because yes, that, fo- sure. that focal length doesn't really matter your aperture. I mean, that focal it, length it, it is, is so far. F- yeah, it is at f11, but it, it is you know still a nice thrown out background. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it also matters distance, um, both in like minimum focusing distance and also just like your actual distance. So if you're farther away from a subject, it's going to create that more draw distance, I guess, and it will draw you know drop out the background out of focus, mm-hmm. which on its own looks pretty artful, I would say. You know. A lot of images where it has a super clean background can look really, really artsy. Like it almost looks like a painting. For sure. Yeah. And like yeah. what you're saying with focus, just kind of a general thing, the closer your, I believe this is right, the closer your subject is to your camera, the more the background will be blurred. Hmm. That's, wh- that's why you can have problems with landscapes if you have a really close foreground. Um, if you focus on that, the rest of your scene will be unsharp, but Generally, if you focus on the background, you'll at least get some sharpness leading back from that. Mm, yeah. I mean, the way I was taught is like if you're using, let's say, a wide angle lens and you point kind of tilt it down, like into a landscape scene, the foreground's always going to be accentuated. Doesn't matter what it is. Mm. So, so yeah, you said to your it advantage. Just, it just all comes down to lens character, really. Mm, lens choice and all that. Yep. Yeah, you know, touch upon focus a little bit. Um, selective focus is something I've tried out a time or two where it's basically the same as uh, manual focus, but like you're just kind of using it to your advantage to make an image look a little bit more far removed from reality. So uh, there's one example I can think of that's it's a giant, I, don't, I actually don't know, I can't recall what leaf it is, but it's a giant like leaf at a botanical garden I was at about a year or two ago. And I get on my extension tube and I do a macro style. But what I do is I kind of, I don't know, I just like mainly focus on the stem, the centered stem of the leaf. And you just have, you know, all the different veins and stuff, you know, branching out from it. And it, it creates this kind of weird look to it where it's like you almost don't really think it's a leaf, I would think. Um, it just has a weird kind of look to it because it's so cropped and zoomed in. And that manual focus throws out the rest of it, um, what you don't focus on out of focus in this regard. Um, that I don't know, I just think it's a neat look and it's something. What aperture do you usually use for that? Um, I could probably check real quick. Uh, let's see. I no, I do not have it in front of me. Um, probably aperture of like something very, very uh, wide. I would say like f five point six and above. That's my guess. So. Hmm. And so when you're using a macro lens, I believe I could be wrong about this, but um, if you use a really wide aperture, it's going to make a really, it's going to bring out, you know, the background a lot more out of focus, I would believe because of that. Yeah. Macro focusing is probably the hardest type of focusing you could go into because it, mm-hmm. it, the closeness of the lens, it you'd think that it would make everything in focus, but it just doesn't. It's like extremely challenging sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would recommend to anyone that wants to do that more, um, or any macro really, is to set it to live view, and then manual focus that way. That's kind of how I do it when I do. Mm-hmm. And and turn on focus peaking if your camera has it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. So, is there any other techniques you use, Henry? I don't really do too much with the selective focus. Um, what I will say with the macro is my aperture I use usually is f eight. I just found. Especially for the smaller flowers, I find if I focus on the center, um, that'll get the leaves or the not the leaves. What I'm saying, the petals and the it's all the kind of texture and focus, but still a really really blurry background. Um, I'm usually out at like 240 millimeters on my lens um, for mm-hmm. that, uh, and wow. I like to get nice and close, kind of fill the frame. I don't have a macro lens, but it's pretty much macro, I would say, uh, yeah. which is nice. I am thinking about getting some extension tubes too. I don't, I don't know how much an effect that'll make, um, but you know, very. <laughs> <laughs> There's not there there. I will say they're a very affordable um, attachment option to just make macro photographs. Like all of mine are done with it, at least so far. Yeah, and they they don't cost that much. They really don't. And I, I was thinking about throwing that on my uh, 85 millimeter f 1.8, and really just kind of I really like the look of that focal length. Um, I feel like sometimes 200 is too compressed for flowers, just personally. So mm-hmm. I'd really like to experiment with that, see how that looks. Um, 
And I know yeah. Thomas Heaton has been using that combination for his macro. He didn't do too much, but uh, I watched his video. He, he's the same lens as me, and he used extension tubes with that, and that worked great. So, oh, that's cool. I think yeah, he got like a set of three for like less than a hundred hundred pounds in his country uh, or something like that. It wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't that much at least. Uh huh. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, F8 is a good choice as well. That's kind of a good middle ground, I would say. Yep. Um, but I would say if you're trying to specifically macro, this isn't really abstract, but if you're trying to capture like a bug or something, um, I would say definitely like F11 at least because it can be really hard to get focus on that guy. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. That Yeah, that focus will be hunting like the whole time, I'd imagine, especially if it's moving around, mm. buzzing about or whatever. Very, very complicated for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to get like a really in-depth macro photographer on here sometime. I mean, there's me. <laughs> like I, I, I do yes, quite a bit. Yes, like, yes, yes, I, I just mess. Yes. <laughs> we could do I a mean, macro like, episode. That's an idea. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, like also the people who like walk around with like a portable studio, like they have their lights set up for the field and like. Oh uh, yeah. The lens, um, the macro flash, uh -huh. like that ring light. And they got like vintage flipped over lenses with like eight <laughs> extension tubes and stuff. Custom modded and all that. Uh -huh. That's cool. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes. Well, I think I think that about wraps it up. I, I was going to ask one more question. So, uh, Henry, do you consider abstracts a legitimate form of photography? Pretty much oh, for sure. Answer. For sure. Just like um, painting abstracts is legitimate. Um, it is as well for photography. Um, it's it's really a large catch-all term as well. So there's so many different sub-genres and just it, all abstracts are photog photographic art, in my opinion. Yeah. It, it's like if you take an image, I would consider that a photograph. I would consider that photography. So in this regard, it's like that's that's what it is. It's abstract. It's mm -hmm. just a different type of it. It's, it's one that's, like I said, it's niche. It's not really – it's not frowned upon, I don't think, but it's just like one that really is – you know, oft forgotten because mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, there's no, in most cases, it's like, oh, there's no uh, like clear defined subject or there's no focus part of the image. It's just kind of like a thing. And it's like, what do you even call that? What do you interpret that as? And I'm like, well, it's, it's art. <laughs> it's all yep. it is really then. Mm -hmm. I mean, other forms of art don't put rules on things. So why should photographers put rules on their art? You know? Yes. Yes. hundred percent. This man knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, so, uh, um, real quick, do you have any announcements or anything? Uh, I, I, I don't really I, don't have much. Yeah, I don't really have much either. Um, like we said, there's we got a pretty big guest coming up soon. Um, probably in about two weeks for you guys. Uh, we'll have that podcast out two or three weeks. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, and we'll also be going on this person's podcast as well. So. Um, be excited mm. for that, I guess. Um, <laughs> you told yeah, us. I will say you told them too much. It, it, yeah, uh -huh. it's a landscape photographer, um, pretty reputable one. So if you like that, make sure you definitely tune in. Uh, and that, that's so pretty much it for me. I don't really have any personal announcements. Yeah, same here. All um, right. Yeah. Well, sorry Leave if it. this is a bit of a tangent, um, but it is just like the title. It's abstract photography, so like abstract podcast, I guess as well. So. <laughs> It's all over the place. <laughs> yeah. It's been great. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.